The Lord be with you. Welcome to another 316 video. Today we're looking at Job 316, which is a really good passage. And I'd like to take some time to maybe provide an overview of the book of Job. While Job 316 is good, it is depressing, maybe a little dark. And I'd like to provide uh, some of the background as to what's going on that makes Job say such a thing. Uh, I've changed the board behind me a little bit. I like to stand in this spot, which hides a lot of the board. And as we typically read one way in English, all the important stuff is usually right behind me. So we're going to be a little bit more Semitic in our uh, reading. We're going to go this way in our reading. What I've put on the board, that's sort of the basics, the important stuff. What's behind me that you can't read so well is uh, more topical, uh, broad uh, subjects. So for our overview, the book of Job was written about 2000 BC. That's kind of our best guess, making it an old book. Uh, Job is sort of a mysterious book. We don't know his genealogy. He leaves us no list of his descendants. He's not part of the descendants of Jesus. Not a prophet, not a priest, not a king, but he is called the greatest of the sons of the East. Maybe because he had 7,000 camels and 7,000 donkeys and oxen. He was a wealthy man. And oftentimes, uh, wealth and wisdom were equated together. Job, again, about 2000 BC, uh, just sort of dropped into the middle of the Old Testament. The book of Job is included in the wisdom literature section of the Old Testament. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations sometimes. Wisdom literature uh, tends to be very poetic, songs, has good, useful sayings that the reader can latch on to and learn from. Think of Proverbs. The wise person will not do this, but will do this. Really short couplets. So wisdom lit is a nice little unit within the Old Testament, and we see some of those things here in the book of Job. Giving you the cast of characters on our board. God, yeah. He plays a pretty big role at the beginning and at the end. We meet uh, angels and Satan. Uh, God is in his throne room, his court, and one day the sons of men come and present themselves before the Lord, and Satan comes along with them. I think the sons of men can be equated with angels, that they are there to give a progress report, a status update on what they're doing. Uh, there's, there's really nothing in the text that tells that they are actual human beings. Uh, and we don't have too many written records of people 
appearing before God's court in uh, the heavenly places. And if Satan was there, I think we do have much more evidence that Satan was an angel who rebelled against God. So when the other angels are there giving their progress report on who they're watching over, on how they are uh, doing the jobs God has given them to do, Satan shows up. I've been walking to and fro on earth, is what Satan responds when God asks him, what are you doing here? So we meet them, and certainly we meet Job, his wife. She has a very small role, but it's an important one. And then we meet the three friends. Maybe put quotes around the friends. At first, they do a good job, but then uh, they do not provide the comfort that might be needed. So anyway, uh, those are the cast characters. Behind me are more topical things. I put 38, as in chapter 38. Should also probably put chapter 19 down. Maybe the two most important chapters in the book. The question that uh, can be asked as you look at the people in this story is what changed? God and Job were like this. And then they were like this. What happened? And then the idea of, you know it when you see it. And this is in regards to those who are blameless and those who are innocent. And then finally, a diagram that I think can be helpful in understanding this book. It's a square with a dot in the middle. We'll talk about that in a moment or two. The book is two sections, chapters one, two, and three, and kind of four to the end. It's not divided in half, but the first couple of chapters are narrative about the, the background of the story. And the rest is, uh, we'll say, a dialogue between Job and his three friends, a younger friend who shows up to lend support to the three friends. And then in chapter 38, when God finally reappears. But first, it's God in his courtroom, in his throne room, and the sons of men coming to tell God how they're doing in accomplishing the tasks God has given them. Satan is there. God brings up Job. Hey, have you considered my boy Job? He has never uttered a bad word. He cannot stop thanking and praising me. Satan says, oh yeah, watch this. I'm going to take away everything he has then listen to the swears and the curses come out of his mouth. So all of those 7,000 donkeys and camels and oxen and flocks and all of that, it's all taken away. His children are taken away. And Job does not curse God. So as God and Satan are talking, Satan says, watch this. I'm going to touch his body. And God says, you can't take his life. And Satan says, I wasn't going to. So he makes Job sick. Boils and sores. And we find Job sitting in 
uh, an ash heap with bits of broken potter, and he's taking that potter and he's scraping the boils his itches and trying to find some relief. And his wife says, what are you doing? You've lost everything. Why don't you just finish the job, curse God and die? Just a little bit on the importance of what we say. Curse God and die. Look God in the face and curse him. Job, on hearing his wife's advice, woman, you don't know what you're talking about. I brought nothing into this world and I'm going to die with nothing. It's not the Lord's fault. May the name of the Lord be praised. Naked I came into this world, and naked I will depart. May the name of the Lord be praised. The three friends come. And at first, they do a good job. They sit there silently for a week. And they don't say anything. They just sit there. Sometimes you need that, right? I just want to sit alone silently in my grief, my anger, my hurt, my confusion. Don't tell me what to do, what to feel. You can do that in a little while. But right now, if you're going to do anything, just sit. And the friends do that. When the friends open their mouth, that's when the trouble starts. Are you ready for our 316? You're probably wondering, when are we going to get to that? So I'll read you a little bit. Hmm. This is chapter 213, and then starting with chapter 3. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. Chapter 3. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Not the same as cursing the Lord, but cursing the day of his birth. And he said, let the day perish on which I was born. And the night that said a man is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. Let those curse it who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none, nor see the eyelids of the morning, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth, come out from the womb and expire? Why did the knees receive me, or why the breasts that I should nurse? For then I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept. Then I would have been at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who rebuilt ruins for themselves or with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver. Or why was I not as a hidden stillborn child? 
as infants who never see the light. I think at the very outset of this video, I said Job 3.16 is pretty good. And then I clarified that by saying it's rather dark and depressing. Job is wishing that he'd never been born. That's frightening language. And part of it is Job is starting to wrestle with what changed between him and the Lord. God and Job were tight. Job would offer prayers for his children and his friends. Job would give thanks to God for everything that he had, which was a lot. And then it was all gone. I didn't change. I didn't do anything. What happened that God would leave me? Starting here as Job curses the day of his birth, wishes that the calendar would just omit that day. Job starts to have a dialogue with his friends about what happened. In Job chapter 1, as we're starting to meet him, we learn that Job was blameless. As the three friends start talking to him, they start saying to Job, Stop saying you're innocent. And Job says, I don't say that I'm innocent, I say that I'm blameless. Six of one, half dozen of another. Maybe. But I do think there is a distinction. An innocent person is one who can point out their activities and say, I did good, I did good, I did good, I did good, I did not do anything wrong. A blameless person recognizes that they are not perfect, that they can strive to do something good and their good activity can be received in a wrong way. And they can end up hurting or hindering something or someone the blameless person recognizes that the good things they are able to do do not come from inside. They come from the outside. Job was a blameless person. His friends were saying, stop claiming to be innocent. And that's part of the, you know it when you see it, language. This was part of the Jewish worldview, part of their thought. By looking at someone, you can tell if they've been living right or wrong. That person's wealthy, healthy. He must be doing something right. That person's sick, a beggar blind. He must have done something wrong. You see, you get what you deserve, positively or negatively. So the wealthy person, well, 
He did something right. He earned that wealth by how they lived. Think about what we sometimes hear in the New Testament. I'm thinking particularly of John chapter 9. Lord, said Jesus' disciples, who sinned? This man or his parents that he should be born blind. Who is the guilty party that caused this horrible thing to happen to this man? That's that mindset. You get what you deserve. The lepers must have done something wrong to deserve leprosy. That was the mindset that Job and the friends were operating under. Maybe you've been trying to figure out this box and the dot. And I'm going to say there are really kind of three ways to look at it. Job was great. Always thanking God, praying to God. Very generous. God was proud of Job. And Satan said, yeah, because here's Job. And you put a fence around him. So any bad thing is going to come, hit the fence, and bounce off. Why wouldn't Job say, hey, thanks, God, my day is great. He has never experienced trouble. When Job is in the middle of the storm, he says, God has fenced me in with all of this trouble. The trouble hits me, bounces off, hits the fence, and then smacks me again. And again and again and again. Why? Is God laughing at me? Oh, look at what's happening to Job. He's in the middle of a storm, and the storm can't go anywhere. But focus on Job. The third way is maybe what we start to hear in chapter 38. In chapter 38 is where God comes to talk to Job. Job had been getting more and more insistent that God come and address his questions. What happened? Where did you go? Why are you doing this? I want you to come and answer me. And God shows up. <laughs> and when Job realizes it, when Job listens to God, this is Job's response. I didn't know what I was saying. <laughs> I was a little crazy with anger and frustration and irritation. God speaks to Job out of the whirlwind. And he reminds Job of the relationship and the perspective that Job should have the, re, the perspective that you and I should have in our relationship with God. God's the creator, we're the created. I guess kind of the way it should be. Don't think more about it than that. Creator, created. Keep that in the right order. So, Job, where were you when I created everything? Tell me what role you had, because huh, I don't remember where you were. Maybe I'm overlooking it. Maybe I'm forgetting. Yeah, I've been around for a while. So maybe I forget. Why don't you enlighten me? 
on your role in creation. And Job was silent. I said things I should not have said. And I think that takes us back to our box. It's because the book of Job, if you're looking for firm answers into, you know, again, what changed, you're going to be kind of disappointed. Sometimes in life, it seems that you're in a situation where you're trapped and you can't get out. I understand that there are very well-meaning people who say, hey, when a window shuts, a door may open. Well, maybe when a window shuts, the door also shuts. And you're stuck in that box. That's you in the middle of a room and there's no way out. Now, the one thing to clarify that is to put a second dot in the box. to remind ourselves of what God the Lord has said to us, what God the Lord has promised to us. When we're in a situation where there is nothing but trial and trauma and strife, and there does not seem to be any way out of that room. Jesus Christ inserts himself into that room. We've tried every door and they won't open. We've tried every window and they won't open. Locked doors wouldn't keep Jesus out of the upper room with his disciples. In days of heartache, Jesus comes to be with his people. And he sits there. Um, there's way more to this video that could be said about the book of Job. But as we heard in the last verse of Job chapter 2, the friends sat there seven days and seven nights, and they did not say a word because they could see that the suffering of Job was so great. Sometimes God just sits there with us. And he reminds us that he's with us. We offer him our prayers and he receives them. He lets us know that he hears us. It's a delight to know that when things are bad, when, hmm, I don't know, maybe you lament the day you were born Maybe someone has said to you, I wish you'd never been born. And maybe you start to believe it. You sit in a box. And you think, good, I'm alone. No one knows that I'm here. God knows where you are. As I said a minute ago, locked doors would not keep Jesus from being with his disciples. 
a locked door will not keep Jesus from being with you. Job laments the day of his birth, wishes that day were removed from the calendar. He needed to know that God was around. And so I do think that chapter 38 brings something of an answer to that. I've always been here. I've always been with you. I'm not going anywhere. So nothing has really changed in our relationship with the Lord. It's just that maybe sometimes, instead of watching what we say, instead of guarding our tongue, we may foolishly cover our eyes and we fail to see that the Lord is with us. That's what he wants. And that's what he does. He comes to be with us. So, there's a little on Job 3.16. There's a whole lot on the book of Job. Uh, thanks for hanging in there. I hope you learned something. I hope we all learned something. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.